This song was the theme song of a movie which is called China Night. And the idea was that we would hear spoken Japanese because the movie was a propaganda film to show that the Chinese and Japanese could get along. Jimmy was older than I was, and he got drafted sooner than I did, and he went into the January class of the Army Intensive Language School. Jimmy could read Chinese and Japanese fluently. He and my first husband, Hans Berwald, were very close. They were both in high school together, and he spent a great deal of time at the Berwald house, where he became very interested in the art and he used to say that that was his introduction to, as he called it, high culture. Professor Cahill was the field of art history of China at the University of California at Berkeley for decades. Jim Cahill was, in a way, the pioneer of, of Chinese art history. His overall importance really is just the lifelong enthusiasm and engagement with any aspect of Chinese painting in all its variety and dimensions. I don't know anyone who, who opened the field to more eyes and opinions and uh, exposed more types of pictures and had a wider ranging curiosity about everything. To me, Jim is not just a person of great learning, articulate scholar in Chinese art able to persuade other people to show interest, but also somebody who knows uh, art from other angles, music, films, opera. He had an analytic way of seeing, and he would look at pictures in a way that was both appreciating but also simultaneously dissecting the image. Jim, I think his scholarship, more than anything else, uh, it just vitalized our field. He was in charge of uh, opening up this chest of Chinese paintings that had been unknown to the West. It was really the first time anybody outside of the museum, the National Palace Museum that is, have encountered these uh, objects and, and artworks. Ultimately just put his name on the map because the Skira publication was very successful. In 1974, he received an invitation from the U.S. State Department to join a group of archaeologists who would travel to mainland China at their invitation. And he then regularly, yearly, was invited back, either to lecture or eventually to stay for periods of time and teach there. We met at the International House in Washington, which was a Quaker um, group, and he, uh, there was a piano in the living room, and he left his music on the piano, and I told him that if he did that, it would be stolen, and it was stolen. His parents, I think, were divorced when he was very young, and he spent half the time with someone his mother chose, who dressed him in lavender linen suits, and the other half of the time he spent with someone his father chose and went barefoot. Oh, he was a very good father. He really was. I 
I remember my father building a ship. I was very interested in whaling at the time and Moby Dick and so forth. And so my dad built us a ship or built me a ship in the backyard out of scrap wood with a mast and a crow's nest that I could climb up to. And um, he, he was very interested in building things. He had a large collection of 78s, and that's the way we would really listen to music. He would stack them on the player. They'd drop one by one. And that was part of the whole music listening experience for me, was the thunk of the 78 coming down. He'd get out his pipe, he'd smoke his pipe, and we wouldn't do anything else. We would just sit there and listen to, you know, Mahler's Ninth Symphony or Das Lied von der Erde, he loved. My musical taste, my literary taste, everything that I love really comes from my father. We did one exhibition called The Restless Landscape. I think there were eight girls. We visited dealers and collectors and museums to pick out the pictures we wanted to use in the exhibition. And we all traveled together eight. We went to Cleveland, New York, Boston, and Princeton. And people made fun of him and his eight female graduate students. It was something of a joke to have uh, eight women in a seminar, but Jim delighted in this fact. When we went to Princeton, we confronted another group of graduate students working with Wen Fang, who was, of course, Cahill's dear friend, but also arch nemesis, as we understood it. You know, they had a wonderfully friendly, contentious relationship over the course of their careers. And uh, his students were all men. So it was a very interesting moment, and I, you know, Cahill has written wonderfully about it himself, where he describes the moment when the two groups came together in his hopes that we would, of course, all fall in love and marry one another, and of course that didn't happen. But he found out after we got back to Berkeley that we were being described by our friends at Princeton as Cahill's red detachment of women. The Riverbank was a painting that belonged to C.C. Wong, who was a very good friend of Jim's over many, many decades. That painting was purchased by the Met, and they decided because it was such a big deal that they would um, have a big conference around it, and they invited Jim to participate. He was not afraid to take on the establishment. He would not kowtow to the cultural authorities, either in the mainland, in Taiwan, or in Europe and the United States. C.C. Wong claimed it was an original work by this 10th, 10th century master, um, Cahill, on the other hand, believed that it was a modern forgery by none other than Zhang Da Chen, who was the, the artist that actually got me interested in the field. They're saying it's by Dong Yuan, a painting by someone of whom there are no original existing works, only later copies. And suddenly, in the middle of the 20th century, we get a new painting that nobody's ever heard of before. This is a little odd. Sherman Lee, head of the Cleveland Art Museum, dismissed the painting in even more contemptuous terms. I went to New York just to be there because I figured Jim was going to be attacked by these New Yorkers who think they know everything. And they're wrong. And they hang out that painting repeatedly. I go and look at it again, and I'm absolutely sure it is not a genuine painting of that period. The Metropolitan Museum no longer stands by that claim. It is now attributed to Dong Yuan. He published a book called Pictures for Use and Pleasure, and in it, in the last chapter, he was um, able to describe his um, passion for this form of 18th, mostly 17th, 18th century Chinese painting of beautiful women. And I said to him, we really should do an exhibition of this. What do you think about that? And he said, absolutely. This area of Chinese painting is rather new, and it's something that a lot of people weren't taking very seriously. The interpretation was a huge contribution to the field. He really believed that his immortality would reside in what he wrote. It's as though he wanted to create this virtual, immortal self that would live on forever. And to a large extent, he succeeded, it seems to me. Hello, this is James K. Hill, now in Berkeley, California, and continuing this video series that we began while I was up in Vancouver, titled Gazing into the Past. The first lecture in this series was He wrote on his blog, he said, the thing that scares me is not death. The thing that scares me is that there's so much in my mind that I need to get out before it's too late. 
I admire Jim as a writer, very lucid, very clear, the exception in his field. I value immensely what he taught me. He was just genuinely interested in helping and further the field for the benefit of a greater public. You know, he still um, maintained the sense that this field can only grow, it's never going to shrink. So let's see how far we can take it. And that was actually the dynamic of his very late career as well. He wasn't getting smaller, he was actually getting bigger.